The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, I'm David. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. In this video, we're going to be tearing down something I've wanted to do since we did the first episode of the Electronics Inside, the Dyson 360i robot vacuum cleaner. I think this is pretty unique as a box before we even got to the device. I just think it's kind of cool that the box on each side shows a different side of what's inside. Even the underside is shown on the box. I don't know, I just thought it was a cool touch. The key thing that made me want to tear down the 360i instead of any other robot vacuum cleaner is because it's still a bit of a mystery. I haven't found any other documentation on it, but I remember when it came out, they were making a big deal about this 360i in its name. And you don't even have to see the device. This is the charging dock, which is a nice little design, sits like that. But you can already tell from this something that, as far as I'm aware of, is unique to this robot. These up here are judicial markers. They help machine learning and uh, computers locate things clearly. Uh, it's similar reasons why you get crash test dummies with all the, the grease paint. It's so you can track a focal point in the center there in, um, in the machine learning. That means there's gonna be cameras in this robot vacuum cleaner. Every time you turn this on, you're turning on an internet connected camera that roams around your house. I think it's pretty cool, but we're gonna find out as much as we can about it. Uh, one other thing to mention about this is it says a few times on the box that this is a 160 watt vacuum cleaner. Now, for anybody that lives outside the EU, they may not realize why that's significant because a few years ago, they introduced new legislation which limited the maximum power of vacuum cleaners to, um, to save energy and save the environment, which to me doesn't really make sense because vacuum cleaning should be one of those things which is duty driven. You need to do the same amount of work. It shouldn't make too much difference whether you're doing the same amount of work quickly with a two kilowatt motor or slowly with a 160 kilowatt, 160 watt motor, but it takes you four or five times as long. It's the same amount of energy used. I always found that a weird bit of legislation. Well, here is the robot itself. And I think I was kind of surprised when I first took it out of the box. It's kind of smaller than I thought it'd be. I thought it'd be sort of this circumference which I guess puts it in the same kind of size as a Roomba. Uh, it's noticeably taller but still it's it felt much more compact than I was expecting it to be. Well, before we get too into anything there's obviously some self-assembly that we can do. We've got the bin which is obviously a bagless cyclone model coming from Dyson, of course it had to be. And there's a pair of filters on this as well. So on the back, it says filter, and I think this one's an outlet filter. So once it's been through the vacuum cleaner, the air gets pushed through this. And this, is, this, this pleated filter is called a panel filter. Uh, and these are quite common in the industry, you find them on air handling units. And this one, you know, you can sort of shake the dust out and that's recommended on a monthly routine. And around the front, we also have a bag filter. Now this is a washable bag filter. Again, nice touch, it's not a consumable. You can wash it at home and keep going. To me, that's a really nice thing. So that's taken sort of care of the, the normal routine wear and tear. On the bottom, there is also ooh, a rather gunked up brush, which looks like it could do some love. Uh, but these brushes are actually consumer replaceable. I think you undo each end and then it slides out and you can buy replacements. So the bristles go or if this kind of thing happens. So we've got a little caster on the front. Um, I'm pretty sure we're going to find this has got a Hall Effect sensor or something in it because this is the edge that goes Oh, it's at the rear actually, so it's not going to have much sensing in it because I still want to know how it detects the edges of steps and things. Um, we've got the pair of tracks that are spring loaded. It's really good at getting itself around like over the edges of rugs and mats and, and things like that. You can already see a pair of motors as I spin one of the tracks. 
So we'll get into those, find out a bit more. And you've got these instrument clusters up the front, left and right. And just inside you can see what looks like the front of a jet engine. So that's gonna be the turbine. I'm imagining that this is gonna have exactly the same uh, kind of motor basis in it as the their fancy hairdryer, as their handheld vacuum cleaners, probably even the same motor as things like the Dyson hand dryers there. 10,000 RPM or whatever it is, uh, 100,000 RPM DC brushless motor. It seems to be the core thing in each of their products. Um, getting back to the top, of course, there's this, this little dome. Now this is like my favorite part and I can't wait to find out more of what's behind it, what's under it. This is the eye, this is the, the clever bit. This is what makes this special over any other brand of robot vacuum cleaner. So I can't wait to see what it is. Before we get too into this and really take it apart, this button on top is actually the only physical interface it has. And I can wake it up, it probably go into alarm and get very cross with me. But yeah, that's the feedback you get. There's a little charging light and you press that to pause it. It's gonna get quite cross once it's connected because uh, it's missing its filter and its bag. So uh, no need to turn that on at the moment. Oh, okay. That's probably our first bit of feedback. Can you see that the clear plastic base is actually not completely attached to the opaque plastic body, you see? And when you've got the dust bin on the front, I guess that it's probably the first to knock anything and I can very slightly hear a micro switch. So that's probably its first bit of collision detection. Let's make it safe and get the battery out. That's a big battery pack, obviously Dyson branded. I always kind of admire the, the attempt to hide the obvious in here. I mean, if I got an 18650, I'm pretty sure we could work out exactly how many are in here. Uh, and if a nominal voltage for an 18650 is 3.7 volts, we can even work out how many are in parallel, how many are in series. Uh, there's a Dyson part number, it's not particularly special. It's got four pins on the bottom. I mean, it's a f only 14.8 volts. So you've probably got uh, ground VCC or return path VCC and then probably a temperature sensor to make sure it doesn't overheat during charging or discharge. Uh, and it's 78.44 watt hours or 5,300 milliamp hours. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a good, good old capacity in there. I feel like there's more capacity in there as in the handheld one I've got. It's a good battery. Although only uh, a Dyson part, I dare say if you were feeling brave, you could just buy 18650s and repair it yourself. I, you're braver than I am, but it could be done. Uh, also on the back here there is a USB port. I understand that's for flashing firmware if something goes up with an over-the-air update. Of course this is Wi-Fi connected. I mean, what self-respecting home gadget isn't these days? I find it a bit ironic that this is a consumer replaceable part so obviously you can't guarantee what part a consumer has so they make these giant slots which are coin operated. Now in the past I have taken a few Dyson products apart. Uh, just uh, in, for personal use, repair, cleaning. And they're a little bit kind of paradoxical, if I can say that, because the build quality or the design of the build quality is normally excellent. You know, they're, they're such clever, well thought out designs, but for manufacture and assembly and operation, not for maintenance. So what I mean by that is you tend to find there's a lot of plastic catches and clips um, and notably they tend to use a lot of ABS which is just not as resilient as nylon to kind of operations you might expect to see something like this go through. On the dock you've got these two charging plates so it uses the fiducial markers to position itself right onto these two bars and they make contact under here and that charges the device. Got it. Interesting little position for a RFID tag under this little panel. Just covering a screw, take it out and there's a RFID tag, probably for stock control. Uh, so just as these things are sliding around the factory, they can keep an eye on it as it's manufactured. Looks like that has released the base, but won't allow us access to plugs and connectors to actually get it completely free. So that screw on the bottom looks like it's actually released these sensor modules. Which 
which is fine and wonderfully, just like we saw with the uh, Sanyo projector, all the connectors are nicely numbered, so it's hard for me to get it wrong. <laughs> but what are each of these modules? And so for each module, there's uh, an infrared LED and a receiver. And these two point down, they'll have varying ranges. One will be for very close, because if you imagine they're on the floor, this one's going to make and break first if it comes up against something. Oh, sorry, no, other way, top one first. So that'll have a slightly longer range of about an inch, and this one will be half an inch. And they are standard modules, all numbered. They look like they clip in place. Wow, that was a monumental effort and I broke a bit. Okay, so finally we're at some good, interesting electronics. Uh, a port here that says main micro and a port here that says safety. So I'm gonna go ahead and guess they're debug headers for checking the health uh, and the status of various components. A Rev8 board, I didn't think this was too old. I mean, the original version came out in 2014 uh, and this is uh, an older one. I don't know exactly how old this is. There is a Texas Instruments big board. Now I'm going to... They've definitely conformally coated this whole board and that's making it really difficult to read any of the uh, markings on the integrated circuits. Right. This is probably not the appropriate order to do it in, but I'm so keen to get in and see the camera module that we're going for that next. Bigger module than I expected. There's a whole load of depth behind there and going down to otherwise an unimpressive camera. It'd be super cool to find out the spec on this camera module. We'll probably find out what resolution and everything. Unfortunately, I don't think I've got any other camera sensors that don't have any built-in optics that I can just use. Even taking the lens off one of my cameras I shoot with, uh, you end up with a sensor that's yeah, three quarters of 35 millimeter or full frame. Uh, I'm never going to get the focal length down to that size. Um, I'll have to have a think about that one in the future, and if I ever manage it, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try and get some stills and let you guys know. Okay, so what have we got on this bottom board? So this little wiring harness which runs down on the outside here was where we picked up our front module, so this is where the, one of these two shoulder modules sat, just like that with the four sensors and they run back to a nice single connector that's actually a nice touch i always like it when people consolidate connectors it does make life a lot easier uh, then we do have a sensor module on the corner or some kind it's on a separate header up here and it's on separate connectors so we can get that out and have a look uh, so there's a nice big led at the top so the de port <laughs> uh, I'm going to assume that's going down to something to do with the actual vacuum cleaner because that's actually got a gasket sealed around all the cords there. Um, based on its position, I think that must be the high frequency drive to the motor, the, the vacuum motor. Uh, last pin and a nice big plug. I'm going to assume that is for the roller. The roller? Yeah, the brush. The, the brush connection. So again, a lot on here. We've got another Texas Instrument microcontroller by the looks of things. Lovely power management and regulation. On the underside, a lot more test points. They, they have gone to town with test points on this thing. I would love to know what the failure rate of the, of the assembly line is for this because there is so many test points. They must test absolutely everything, which, which as a consumer is fantastic. That's a great thing to hear. While we're doing this, I've got to ask, I'd love to know what everybody's thoughts on robot vacuum cleaners are. Um, I wanted to do this teardown because I thought the mystery behind the technology, they never seem to release much about what this could and couldn't do on a low level. I mean, obviously it's a robot vacuum cleaner, but uh, I was always fascinated by the 360 machine vision and what it might be able to do. But what, what do people think on robot vacuum cleaners as a whole? If you've got one, do you think it's good enough? Uh, do you own one but think it's just horrendously lazy? Or do you think it's the best thing you've ever bought? Let's have a discussion. Let us know over at the Element 14 community. Let's see if these are the best thing ever or a sign of how lazy we've become. There we go. Here's the 
bottom half, you've got, wow, that entire wiring loom with a lovely little gasket on it is the, just, just for driving that high speed motor for the brush. And that must be a very high speed motor. It's got a, like a geared reduction on the belt. Springs. I hate springs. Man, they just sound like they want to hurt you. Oh, nice. That micro switch that I could hear from bumping this edge is not actually one micro switch. It's two. So you actually get some directional feedback if they're not both triggered. Okay, that is the bit that does the sucking. Big, big power connector straight off the battery controller. These two little connectors in here, which sat in here and here, I pulled it out accidentally as I was doing it. The airflow path is from the brush up here, through this pipe, through the cyclone, which is separate, it uses physics to separate the uh, dust from the airstream. That airstream is then pulled through here, through that little ducted connection on the back, through the motor. So the air flows this way, cooling the electronics, through the battery chamber, and then finally out through the pleated filter on the back. So all of that air gets dirty, goes through the bucket, deposits the dust, through the motor, cools the motor, cools the battery, through the filter, out the back. Whew, that felt like hard work. But it's a really neat little design, clever. Very, very clever. Now these motors, these tiny little motors are electronically commutated motors. So if, you, if you're if you not familiar, when somebody says a DC brushless motor, they probably mean an ele electronically commutated. If you go back to the motor basics, you've got a, a stator and a commutator, a bit that moves and a bit that stays still. Now, DC motors have a fixed magnet that requires the electromagnet to change its pole and historically you do that with brushes a bit of something that makes contact with the the copper winding um, but of course that means there's a very very lossy part of the circuit it's just bits rubbing together and it means that they also wear down you have to replace brushes if you're going to have a piece of equipment for a very very long time um, so the first time I was aware of electronically commutated motors and the first place most people have probably come across them is PC fans. So the, the cooling fans inside computers, um, once you plug them into the three pin headers on the motherboard, they are electronically commutated. They use pulse width modulation or basic electronic pulsing to simulate that changing of poles. And they have little wound magnets on the center that actually spin fixed permanent magnets that go on the rotor. Now that means that there's no moving parts and you can control normally how fast they go with the speed of the pulse rate on the motor and you have an electronically commutated motor. Now as far as I'm aware, this is the same thing. It's just an incredibly high speed version of it. Kind of a little bit interested to find out if there's any feedback on the track modules because I wouldn't be surprised to find out that these are uh, stepper motors and actually they have uh, some sort of feedback almost like a servo uh, full rotation servo just so they can get really good feedback on position and where it is let's see if we can get one of these track modules out and clean so these track modules again very high gear reduction when you're talking about high quality and high nice manufacturing touches the very fact that these are actually metal gearboxes rather than plastic that gives you an indication of well actually it gives you an indication of how a torque go through it for a start but that's that's a nice touch you don't even get in some power tools that plastic gears and uh, but yeah metal that's lovely i don't think i can quite squeeze the top off of here Right, on this top edge, you can see there are three connections, which makes me think it's probably probably a nine pole motor. And round at the bottom, you can see three additional little ICs at the bottom. And I'm gonna go out and say that is a hall effect sensors. And that is an incredibly powerful tool for knowing 
physical position, along with a camera. I'm not sure if you can get 3D machine vision out of a fisheye lens, but I think when you combine that degree of motion and offset you get from that fisheye lens with the control you have on the motors, I think you probably can rebuild a 3D or simulate range finding at the very least. And a place with the very high quality PCBs, um, it's a really nicely engineered machine. Not engineered for maintenance, but very, very cool. And if anybody ever fancies hacking some custom firmware, there's a nice USB port so you can try and do the same. Or you can get the cover off and get low level access to the IC using the debugging ports. I think that's a cool device and it clearly works. I've had this thing running and it works pretty awesome, to be honest. Uh, I refrain from saying it's amazing and everybody should get one because I've got no basis for comparison. I've never had uh, access to another robot vacuum cleaner, but the tech on this one is seriously cool and at the very least I can say it does do the trick. But like everything, it comes at a cost. And in this case, it's a literal cost, monetary cost. This thing's expensive. Now, somebody that has experience of this and another one can tell me whether they think this justifies the additional cost. There's certainly a lot of high quality hardware here, but does it result in a better clean? Is it so superior that you would warrant spending that amount of money on a vacuum cleaner? Let's have a discussion. If you want to have a discussion or you want to come up with a suggestion for your own teardown, head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching and hopefully I'll see you next time.